Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Washington Leadership Institute Community Service Project. We are excited to be here, and my name is Erica Evans, and I, along with Miles Russell, will be your moderators for tonight. So our goal with this webinar is to listen. It's to listen to gain tools and wisdom on how to dismantle and combat white supremacy as underrepresented attorneys in the legal profession. Now we have a group of panelists that are national stars and giants in our legal community. We're gonna start by first introducing Jeffrey Robinson. Jeffrey is a national superstar. He is the executive director and founder of the Who We Are Project, an organization that aims to change the American history on racism and how it's told. And it does that through having objective and real stories told to talk the truth about white supremacy and how it has perpetrated our American history. Jeffrey is also the former deputy director of the ACLU. He is a Harvard Law School graduate and former state and federal public defender. In addition to being a nationally recognized trial attorney, Jeffrey has an upcoming feature length film that is going to be titled Who We Are, A Chronicle of Racism in American, America that will be released this winter 2021. Jeffrey, thank you for being here. Our next panelist is Twyla Carter. She is the National Policy Director at The Bail Project, a national nonprofit organization that provides free bail assistance and pretrial support to thousands of low-income people every year. Prior to joining The Bail Project, Twyla was a senior staff attorney in the Criminal Law Reform Project at the ACLU National Office, where she litigated local and state bail inequities and right to counsel protections in the federal courts and designed alternative bail and representation policies and procedures. Prior to working at the ACLU, Twyla was a public defender for 10 years. Twyla is a frequent speaker in all aspects of the criminal legal system, including bail and police reform and right to counsel issues. Thank you for joining us, Twyla. Our next amazing panelist is Sharon Sakamoto. Ms. Sakamoto is a third generation Japanese American that was born in an American concentration camp in Idaho. Ms. Sakamoto and her family were released to Spokane, Washington in 1994. She went on to obtain her Bachelor's of Science from Seattle University and taught in the Seattle Public Schools for 16 years. She then went on to receive her Juris Doctorate degree from the University of Puget Sound. Ms. Sakamoto is one of the founding members of the Asian Bar Association of Washington and its first president. She is a well-regarded trial attorney and was part of the Core Nimbus team that had the conviction of Gordon Hirabashi overturned. It was a United States Supreme Court case that the United States Supreme Court said that applications of curfews applied to minorities were constitutional. We are honored to have you, Ms. Sakamoto. Thank you for being here. Our fourth panelist is Denise Diskin. She serves as the first executive director of Q-Law whom she joined after nearly 10 years of legal practice representing individuals harmed by discrimination. Prior to her legal career, Denise worked for several years as a labor organizer, as a teacher, and as a manager for community arts and events projects. Denise has had an extensive volunteer career with the QLA Foundation prior to her service as the executive. She started in 2009 as the member of the LGBTQ Legal Clinic Committee, which she went on to chair from 2011 to 2013. She also started a partnership clinic with the Ingersoll Jenner Center. Thank you for joining us, Denise. Now, we all have a list of questions that we're gonna be asking you, but we wanna let you know up front, if there are answers that you want to add after a speaker has answered a question, please do so if your heart moves you to. I'm gonna now kick it off to Miles to start our questions. Thank you, Erica. Our first question is for all of our panelists. Since America is built on racism, how do we dismantle the white supremacy written into the laws of the land, considering the fact that the spirit of the laws has never left? I think a large part of being a lawyer and a large part of what you can see in law school is that you're being taught to analyze things. And an analysis of just where and how much 
white supremacy and racism has infected our legal structure is critical to understanding not only how our legal structure operates, but how it can be fixed. I don't know that it is necessary to tear down our legal structure because the same legal structure that has those elements of white supremacy and racism in it also has elements that resulted in the reversal of those convictions for people uh, who defied the curfew orders, uh, Japanese Americans who were saying, no, I'm a citizen, I'll do what I want. Um, there have been all kinds of things where we have used the law to advance those issues. So for me, it's not about dismantling the legal system. It's more about having what uh, many people would call, or what I, I will say one person, uh, the author, uh, William Burroughs, would call a naked lunch moment with our legal system. And Burroughs defined the naked lunch moment as that moment when everyone has to look at what's really on the end of their fork. And so as we analyze the things in our legal system and recognize white supremacy and racism, we also have tools in the system to try and root that out. So I think we can do it with the system we have. I would like to jump in and I concur, Jeffrey, in the sense that um, dismantle is a, a, a little bit of a threatening word, and I really believe we can make changes systemically, but we have to take our place, find our place, take our place, and get in there and maintain the struggle. I, I want to quickly go back and correct. I, I've never been a trial attorney, and um, I actually shy from speaking publicly generally. So I come to this panel with awe and appreciation for the other panelists. But I, I, I want to say that there is a place for all of us in, in this struggle of uh, changing how the structures have been set up and are applied. And I, and I think it means we step up, we take our place, we find our place, and you know, be proud of what we have the opportunity to do. I'm happy to jump in here as well. Certainly agree with the co-panelists and, and what they're saying. Would also add in building on, I think what they're saying is to not just be actively engaged in the issue, but really take action in dismantling when you do see, let's say, blatantly racist laws. There is, you know, a story that maybe you saw in the national news in Parrish County, um, Allen Parish, excuse me, Louisiana, where a Black deputy wasn't able to be buried at a particular cemetery because he's Black, because the bylaws said no colored people can be buried there. Now, certainly shocking or not when you consider that that's in the bylaws, but we all know that to be true because that's how laws and, and whatnot have been written in the past. What is shocking that is that in 2020, folks who read that could not do something different and could not make an exception to allow him to be buried there. So on one side, it's recognizing the blatantly racist laws that we have and actually engaging in conversations and in actions that will repeal and undo that damage. And then also to, you know, Sharon and Jeff's point is being actively engaged enough to where you can make a difference, whether it is collectively demanding that no new laws are passed without a racial impact statement, similar to a fiscal impact statement. It's staying engaged with local elections so that you are actually, you know, being a part of electing and making sure that people who are being appointed to positions of power are the right people, that they're transformative in their words and in their actions. And whether that means stepping up as, as Sharon points out and deciding to run for office yourself, because what it is about is taking over some powers that we can start to dismantle, change, whatever word you want to use and separate what we see as white supremacy that's baked into our laws. Yeah, I'll just, um chime in first i'll say i i am odd and honored to be here with this group of folks you all are amazing and and um some of you i've i've actually followed your career a little bit and so i'm a little bit um 
having a little bit of a, a fangirl moment. <laughs> so I'm really happy to be here. Um, and I think, you know, what I see is, you know, a little bit to what Jeffrey started out by saying is, you know, I really see our legal system as a series of agreements. Um, and we have to decide if we still agree with the things that have been the system for a long time. We have, we have to decide if we still agree with this is what we still want. Um, and I think some of that is about who makes our laws, um, right? I mean, they're, they're words on a paper that we all decide we're gonna, we're gonna give power to and we have to decide who we want putting words on that paper. And then I think we also have to kind of look at our courts and, and have our courts be systems of conscience, right? We need courts of conscience that can really look at what's the, what's the downstream impact of, um, of the, the decisions that we, that we are making, right? And are we actually upholding the spirit of the law? And to what Twyla said a moment ago, you know, I really see our Washington Supreme Court is fascinating right now in this particular moment. Um, in just the last six months has been incredibly transformative in terms of how they've approached um, approached writing legal cases, including a sua sponte order that revoked a racist anti-Indigenous law or an anti-Indigenous holding on fishing rights from, I think, the 1920s. There was no case in front of the court. They didn't wait for a case to from, come in front of the court. They just said, yeah, actually, like, that's, we're, no, we're done with that. Similarly, in a recent, um, a recent decision, they did a footnote that wasn't, you know, didn't pertain to the, the core legal question, but it was a footnote that essentially undid precedent that we have here in Washington around um, redlining in a Seattle cemetery. We had a horrible racist decision from the 1960s around um, excluding a, a black family from burying their child in a, in a local cemetery. And the court took the opportunity to say, nope, we're not, that's not, a, that's not good law anymore. Um, I see that as, as a wonderful example um, and something I'd really, I really like to see our legal system doing because I think sometimes we we wait a little bit for the opportunity. We wait, we we do a little bit of strategy playing about how we want to change law. And in some ways, I really think that we just have to think about who's writing them and what we do with them. Thank you all for your thoughtful answers to that question. This next question is specifically for you, Jeffrey. You mentioned in episode three of your podcast, Who We Are, A Chronicle of Racism in America, about the Pledge of Allegiance and how the full version has this verse that basically says, if you fight against America, we will hunt you down because no refuge will save you and we will put you in the dirt for challenging America for your freedom. Do you think that the United States that we should have a new Pledge of Allegiance given the racism that's blatantly written into our national anthem that's played at everything in our, in our states. The national anthem is an important issue. And uh, I will just quickly say for those who don't know the entire story that there were escaped enslaved people that fought for the British during the War of 1812. And they were part of a, the group that attacked Washington, D.C. and set the White House on fire. Francis Scott Key saw that happen. And three and a half weeks later, he was in Baltimore Harbor seeing the bombing of Fort McHenry. And that's when he wrote the poem that became the national anthem. The end of the third verse says, no refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. And the Star Spangled Banner in triumph doth wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Many people have never heard that third verse, don't even know that it exists, but it does. What I would say about changing the national anthem is this. I think the national holiday for Juneteenth that we just saw is the perfect example. That came out of nowhere, except it wasn't really out of nowhere. Where that came from was the fact that for 14 or 15 days, America was rolling in stories about the Tulsa massacre. From May 30th all the way through, the events that were being held there, national press, 
all kinds of stories. A documentary came out. America was rolling in the horror of the Tulsa massacre. And that's why Juneteenth got made a holiday, two days before it's celebrated. It cost the federal government about $450 million to shut the government down for each federal holiday. That means that in the next 10 years, we're going to spend over $4 billion celebrating Juneteenth. And that is a fine and wonderful thing. It is an important earmark and landmark. But there are many, many people, Republicans and Democrats, who voted for Juneteenth as a holiday, but they're uncertain or against H.R. 40, the bill that would form a commission to investigate not just slavery, but what came after slavery up until today, and then make reparatory proposals to Congress. And when people say that would cost billions of dollars, my response is, you just spent $4 billion over the next 10 years on a freaking holiday. So changing the national anthem would be a great thing. But that's not my number one priority. My priority is something that's going to start changing people's lives. And I think that we can point at the national anthem and how that came about to help people understand just how deep-seated this anti-Black racism is in America. And so that's, that's where I come down on that question. I will definitely support a new national anthem, but talk to me about that after H.R. 40 gets passed. Can I just add to that, though, because I appreciate Jeff going in on that, because he's right. Like, we've got Black Lives Matter painted all over the streets. We changed the Aunt Jemima bottle. Band-Aids now come in my shade. That is window dressing as always. We have yet to do the substantive work to have real truth and reconciliation in this country. So completely agree. They can change the words all they want. Nobody knows the, the original words anyway, the new words, the, the revised words. But if it's not real transformative change, then... And, and to, to Jeff's point, you know, just to get a commission together, there was an anti-lynching law last year that, you know, certain Republicans and, and 16 people didn't even vote on at all. And, and four Republicans voted no. So we can't even agree that Black Lives Matter just as a, as a statement. So I appreciate his comment on that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jeffrey and Twyla. Um, our next question is for Denise. Denise, what do you see as the Q Laws Foundation role in addressing the issue of white supremacy? So I think you know, what I do with Q Law Foundation is, is work deeply within LGBTQ queer and trans communities for not just legal education resources um, and access to justice, but also to really uplift and um and sort of approach um approach our communities as inherently powerful. Um, and I think one of the things that white supremacy really does, it's so baked into our legal education, right? We're really trained as lawyers to, um, you know, in the attorney-client relationship, to be kind of, you know, to impart knowledge, to stand in the shoes of our clients, right? To advocate for, not advocate with. And I think that's something that QLaw Foundation is working really hard to do in terms of um, sort of standing with LGBTQ queer and trans communities and um, and not being attorneys who sort of stand speak on behalf of our communities. Part of that is that we are historically a predominantly white organization, much like um, the legal community that we arise out of. Um, you know, that is a huge, um, a huge sort of issue that our organization is working on and also is um, is something that I think we are in a position to, to kind of, I don't want to say bridge build because I, I don't, I don't love the notion of bridge building, and I, I, I have a different question that we'll talk about where I wanted to talk about that more, but, um, but really I think what we're doing is breaking down that idea that attorneys are sort of um, the top of the knowledge power structure. Um, and really recognizing the inherent power in our communities. And we do that in a lot of really concrete ways, right? One way is, um, is how we train our volunteer attorneys and how we train other attorneys. So we get asked a lot, like, can you come and do a presentation on how we can best work with and be inclusive to LGBTQ communities? And one of the first things we say is listen to BIPOC, listen to black and brown, queer and trans people, 
right? They're going to have better information than most lawyers on how the system actually works. Um, you know, I'll give you one example that I use is that, um, is that I, when the district courts reopened um, to provide name change documents again, um, you know, for a long time they were closed because of COVID, I didn't learn that they had reopened from the court, although I was calling every couple of weeks to find out when that was going to happen um, so that trans people could get their name changed. I didn't learn that from, um, from other lawyers. I learned that from the Seattle Queer Exchange, which is a really active Facebook group where queer and trans folks share community information, right? And this is not like unique to our communities. This is something all marginalized people do, right? Because the systems are not built for us. So we talk to each other um, and, you know, we protect each other. We have these survival networks where we're sharing information. Um, and that's something that we really purposefully lift up. Um, I am the only attorney who works on our staff. Admittedly, we have a very small staff. But when I had the opportunity to bring in some new staff to do some COVID relief work, I thought to myself, like, gosh, do I want attorneys doing this work? And I thought to myself, you know, any legal issue we're doing community information on is Googleable, right? Like, we can figure that part out. What, what, I can't Google, right? What we can't, what we can't do on our own is community outreach, right? And is having an understanding of how things like the eviction moratorium or the lifting of the eviction moratorium will impact um, queer and trans BIPOC communities. So I brought in community organizers. So we have um, trans black and indigenous community organizers working for our organization, doing our community legal resource development. And I think that's really, you know, that to me is how we break down the legal information so that it is supportive of communities. Not that it comes from lawyers, because a lot of times, you know, lawyers, we're, we're always taught we're the smartest people in the room. And a lot of times we are actually demonstrably super not. So, <laughs> so that's one of the, the, one of the ways that we're doing it. I really think it's, you know, um, about lifting up and giving credibility to our community networks. Thank you, Denise, for sharing that. The next question I have is for Jeffrey, Sharon, and Twyla. How do each of you work towards undoing white supremacy in the legal profession? And what methods have you found most impactful? Well, I think I'd like to um, piggyback a little bit on, on what Denise just shared, um, because I think the um, kind of overblown thought that a attorneys uh, historically have of themselves is um, one of the uh, uh, structures that continues this white supremacy idea in the law. And, and so that more, the more uh, diverse the population of attorneys can be, it, it does break down this idea that uh, attorneys are the smartest people in the room. Uh, that's not the case. That never really has been the case. But that has, you know, been a, a good deal of why um, it the, the, the profession attracts a number of the people that it does. So I, I think what what I'd like to to say is that. Um, the legal system is just a part of this whole societal structure of white supremacy. And that, you know, the education system and all of the parts of our society need to be kind of um, uh, intertwined in order to really make progress. It, it can't just be the laws, even though this is our work. We are people first, we are families first, we are communities first before we do this job. So the job is part of what we are about in dismantling white supremacy within our systems, um, but it's not the only thing. And I think we have to be consistent in our approach to dismantling white supremacy by how we live our lives at home, as well as at the office, as well as with our clients, as well as with our parents, as well as with our children. I mean, it, it, it's a consistent effort to build a new structure, to change the attitudes, to change the thoughts, and to bring about more camaraderie, more community. That's my thought. 
I'm happy to, to go next. Thank you both for your thoughtful answers on that. It's made me think about some other things as well that maybe I'll, I'll find some time to integrate it into a different answer. But to answer your question, about methods that have been used. So, you know, for me, my way of dismantling, I guess, white supremacy in the legal profession, and for me, the criminal legal system, that's the only reason I went to law school is to be a public defender. So I've had the great honor and privilege of being a litigator for 14 years, doing direct services as well as class action lawsuits. So I've done it one-on-one -on -one and I've done it on a systematic le level on behalf of large classes of people. Now I have the opportunity to do legislation, policy, and advocacy. And having done all of that, I will say all of those tools, litigation, legislation, advocacy, policy, are all marginally effective. They either take too long, they're limited in their scope, in their reach, they cost a lot of money. You know, you can fill in the blank. Not to minimize, you know, the fact that I can get someone home in an individual case, certainly not to minimize you know, the settlement that we have in South Carolina or Georgia or Texas or other states where we've sued around pretrial detention practices and making sure that folks have an attorney. Not minimizing that at all, but am recognizing that the empire always strikes back. The empire will always control, surveil, um, oppress. That's what it does. So for me, the only method that is powerful is something that Sharon and Denise both have touched on, which is mobilizing we the people. I consider myself to be a movement lawyer, which means I use my law degree to build power for people closest in proximity to the injustice. And it means, as Denise touched on, leading from the back, if you will, really engaging with communities that are directly impacted, that understand the problem, understand the solutions better than anyone else, and using my law degree to then work and help with solutions that they help to come up with and help to drive. Also separately, I guess, in trying to work with law students as well as lawyers, I do a, a CLE called Incorporating Race and Culture into Criminal Cases, where you know, I do my best to try to help public defenders and criminal defense attorneys on how to incorporate these issues in their cases, because it is not surprising, but distressing nonetheless, how many people of color who are lawyers who also don't go to the mat on every single case where they have a client of color and who don't incorporate the history of racism into their cases and into their trials and into their theories of the case, et cetera. So really trying to motivate and encourage people and give tangible ways in which they can incorporate real skills into their practice. So I appreciate that question. Thank you. Uh, I'm just trying to think of what I can add to what's already been said because it's been so well presented. Uh, I think I'll pick up on something that Twyla said about um, the difference between individual advocacy, like as a public defender and movement lawyering, where you're doing something that's larger. And the way that those two things come together. One of the things I've been thinking about a lot is people say, well, can public defenders be movement lawyers? And is there a difference? And as opposed to thinking about the places where they are different, I've been thinking about the places where that work overlaps and how it could overlap in an incredibly powerful way. One of the things that I'm going to be an advocate of is that every major metropolitan public defender office have an intern program where they dive deeply into the history of redlining in their neighborhood, in their, in their jurisdiction. And then when they start going to court with, with uh, uh, people who are charged with crimes who have been in poverty for two and three and four generations, we're going to talk about the lack of being able to buy a home and the lack of being able to build generational wealth and the lack of educational opportunity that comes with that. And we're going to start to say to judges, don't set an hour for this sentencing. Set three hours because we're coming. And we have a right to make a record. And you have never heard this before because we have never done this before. And so being unafraid to use social movement principles, issues that come up in social movements in, in the litigation realm, 
Nobody says you can't do that. And if a judge is about to give your client 15 years in prison, I'm going to take 180 minutes. 15 years, it's like almost a minute a year or whatever, you know, do the math, but give me a break. And so part of it is thinking about your job in a different way. When I was a public defender, I'm ashamed to admit, I didn't think of my job that way. I didn't think. What if I went into the history of redlining? Because I know something about redlining from my personal life. I didn't think to do that. And so one of the things that I would challenge folks to do in your individual legal practices is to think about how you can expand that practice to deal with these issues. And the other thing I want to say quickly is it's about speaking up. And it's about saying shit that needs to be said. I'm not saying that you get in somebody's face and you yell and scream at them, but you can say, um, I'm going to hire this person because what they bring to this job with their background and their experience is so much valuable than a 3.8 grade point average that this other person has. And make it explicit. This is what I'm valuing. And then giving those people room to demonstrate who they are and who they can be. That's, one of the, that's what will start changing stuff so that uh, the folks that are listening to this, I'm really hoping that there are fewer and fewer of y'all who are going to be the first at doing something. Because, you know, I, I got a whole lot of them first to do this, first to do that. And that shit, it, it's like, it, it's not an honor. It, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a recognition of how many came before us that didn't have the opportunity. Thank you each um, for those very thoughtful and detailed answers. Um, our next question is for Sharon. Um, Sharon, could you share a case with us where your involvement was directed toward challenging systematic institutional racism? Hi, thank you, Miles. Yes, I had the privilege of, as a law student, coming on to the team that represented Gordon Hirabayashi against the United States. Gordon was coming back after 40 years um, to challenge his convictions on both curfew violation and refusal to report to the camps, which were the camps, I was born in one. And so he was a university student at the time of the incarceration, and he challenged both of those um, laws against Japanese American citizens without a hearing, without any kind of, um, of trial, um, he, ch he put the challenge forward and then was tried and convicted of both those laws, which were um, unjust laws. And um, 40 years later then he came back and it was discovered in uh, that, that the government had actually withheld information and uh, suppressed evidence and not presented um, all of the evidence to the Supreme Court. Um, oh, and on that basis, which is the Quorum Nobis action, uh, the court overturned and vacated his convictions. Uh, it, was a, it was an American case because um, the government continued to challenge and we went up on appeal and uh, basically the Court of Appeals wrote that an American citizen convicted of a crime based on race is lastingly aggrieved. And you know, that is so many of us and, and so Gordon, um, really wanted to go to the Supreme Court, um, but it, it didn't happen that way and the government didn't appeal and we could not appeal a win. Uh, and so we never went to the Supreme Court. But the point was, Gordon had to wait 40 years to get his justice. Uh, people like my parents never really got justice. And I see that 
in so many other communities as well. They are not being justly treated and as we were not. And, and I must speak up, like Jeffrey mentioned, I must speak up when I see these things now. I have more knowledge now than I did when I was growing up. People in my community didn't talk about the hurt and the injustice. I'm not sure why. I think in part because it hurts so much. Um, but in any event, um, I was not taught to speak up. I was not taught to develop the skills of a trial attorney. Uh, I worked on the team though, and I learned so much about people working together for something that is right and people respecting each other and all that they bring to the table and that it isn't not, it isn't one person, it is all of us as the team um, that really got Gordon what he deserved, which was a vacation of those convictions that stayed with him throughout his life until 40 years later, he was able to make them right. So thank you. It was a, it was a big challenge. It, it showed me that um, the, the government really covered up what it was doing back then. And even today, the government will defer under the name of national security or some other title. The government will, uh, the Supreme Court will defer to other uh, branches of the government uh, when it really has its role to uphold justice and speak the truth. I think that kind of taught me what lawyering was all about, that um, we really need to go always for truth and justice and um, make sure that in the end, it's truth and justice that went out. Not easy. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sharon. And on that same vein of what you're talking about, of you know, people from underrepresented groups being treated unfairly in, in our uh, country, that brings me to my next question, specifically uh, directed at Twyla. Um, my question is, what advice do you have for a young woman of color that want to enter the legal profession when we all know it's dominated by white patriarchy? What advice do you have for them um, in navigating this intersectionality? You know, that's a really great question. And first, I would say what I say to all young people, regardless of race, gender, sex, et cetera, which is to think about how you want to change the world, what you're 10, 12 hour day is going to look like and work backwards and first decide if you even need a law degree. It's a lot of blood, sweat and tears to go down this road to not really have a purpose and a reason why you're doing it, especially if you wanna change policy or something along that line. So I just wanna put that out there first. Next, I would certainly say for young women of color, you know, the same way that you've been navigating this country is the same way you're gonna navigate the legal profession. The difference is, is that you're going to have a little more privilege and a little more power and authority to be able to do something about it. Certainly know who you are, know yourself really well, know your gut, and accept the fact that you are going to see white supremacy, microaggressions, white patriarchy, all of the above in the legal profession as well as you would going to the store, going to school, getting services from a doctor, et cetera. So just know that, that that doesn't change just because these are supposed advocates that you are now becoming a part of you know, this exclusive club. I would definitely say to find a mentor of women of color who either work in your exact legal profession, in your firm, in your organization, or just generally, so that they can help assist you work through all the different experiences that you might have, whether they're large or small, explicit or implicit. And I would also say, recognize that there is some level of compromise that you're going to have to make and you need to think about where that line is for you. There are some level of annoyances and microaggressions that come because this country is a racist country and we all have been raised to be discriminatory towards each other and to interpret body language and emails and et cetera in particular ways. So just know that whether it comes by way of 
you being asked to take notes at a meeting or, or being expected to remember everyone's birthday celebrations or, you know, when you say something with passion, then you're the, you know, the angry fill in the blank, you know, woman. Just, just be aware that that exists. Uh, document it if you need to. Keep track of it. Decide if it's something you can tolerate or not. Have your mentors to be able to talk through about, about it. But, you know, recognize that you're going to need all the skills and tools that you've been using to navigate through life to get you to this point of being in law school and, and joining a firm organization as a young lawyer to begin with. I will also point out the flip side of that, though. The flip side is that white guilt, especially if you're going to live in practice in a liberal, white proclaimed, self-proclaimed, I should say, liberal and progressive area like Seattle, which is my home as well, you're going to encounter really well-meaning white people on the job who may or may not give you very honest criticisms about your performance. So while you're also seeking out mentors to help you just navigate the space, also look for people of color, women of color in your exact job who you can do tasks with, projects with, so that when you're receiving constructive criticism, it doesn't have the underlying tone of does this have anything to do with race, gender, or an other issue that you don't know about instead of just being the merits of your performance. I do find in my experience that a lot of really wonderful uh, white people who are very self-aware of implicit bias and racism then tend to be paralyzed with guilt when it comes time to actually giving you honest feedback about your work. And that's not helpful to you in your personal and professional development. So again, seeking out people of color, women of color that can also advise you in a very real way, not just to navigate the space, but to also counsel you in an in a honest way that's going to help you develop and improve over time. Appreciate that question. Thank you, Twyla, for um, the depth of the guidance you gave in that, que in that answer to that question. Um, our next our next question is for for each of the panelists, and the question is: What role does allyship play in dismantling white supremacy? And what are the biggest challenges to allyship, in your opinion? And how do we overcome them? Um, I'm going to ask Denise to go first with this one. I think she's been waiting for this one. Am I right, Denise? This, this is the <laughs> one, right? I have, I have. I think for me, you know, Twyla, you you just kind of broke my brain open in a new way a minute ago. So I'm, I'm reeling a little bit from that. Um, and, um, just really, um, really feeling that, that, you know, I think, um, I think white supremacy culture really requires us to be dishonest and to interact with each other, um, based on what we see and not who we see. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of allyship, I think, you know, for white folks, this can't be an intellectual exercise. Um, and I think, you know, we, we sort of joke about like something horribly racist happens in the world and white people join book clubs. Um, and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll be real, our racial justice committee on the QLA Foundation board also did a book club, but we're doing other things too. <laughs> but I think that, you know, I was thinking about this today because, you know, it's it's like 105 degrees. I don't know if it cracked 110 quite in downtown Seattle, but it's it's hot as blazes in Seattle today. And there are people working in Kent in the Amazon warehouse who don't have air conditioning. Now, if I advise one of those people about their rights at work, I'm going to go home to my house, which is mildly warm. We also don't have air conditioning, but I'm not doing heavy labor in it. And I have a, a nice air conditioned office to go to. So I can talk to that person all day long about their rights and nothing changes for me based on the outcome for them. And I think that's one of the things that, that I think as white people, we really have to get real about, right? We talk about the true costs of a lot of things, right? Particularly, um, you know, what's the true cost of our food, for example, if we're paying $5 for a flat of strawberries, are we really accurately paying for the, the true cost of bringing those strawberries up from, you know, California or wherever they were grown? We need to get real about the true cost of racism, right? And I think as white people, we don't feel it because systemic racism has meant that, the, has meant that we don't feel the, the true costs. So I think, you know, a lot of that has to be 
about not seeing each other as sort of like, I think it's sometimes when we talk about like we're building community or we're building understanding, we think about it like we're building a bridge between one pod of people and another pod of people. And I think we really need to be seeing it. And when I say we, I, I, I sometimes as a queer person, sometimes play a little fast and loose with we and us. <laughs> so here I mean we as in white people need to see ourselves as interconnected, right? We're not building bridges. We have to be in a web with our neighbors such that if there's a problem in one part of the web, there's a problem in the whole web, right? You can think about it as there's a disturbance in the force. We need to all feel that disturbance in the force in a real way, which I think means changing how we see our communities and changing how we see the impacts of these systems of power, right? We have to be willing to see, you know, see a, an example of racism, see, you know, a, a, one of the many, many, too many murders that we are seeing um, by police, you know, and be able to feel that as something that impacts us because we are not living in a healthy community where things like that are going on. Um, in terms of specific to the legal profession, um, I feel really strongly that white lawyers need to start to recognize when bias is happening. Um, start to recognize it in courts and practice what you're gonna do, right? I hear this a lot from folks when I do trainings about, you know, again, representing queer and trans folks. And, you know, I had um, an example recently where I was representing a black trans woman in a local court related to an anti-harassment order. And, um, and the difference in the court treatment when she went for her first hearing by herself and when she went for her second hearing with me was so stark, same judge, but completely different treatment. And that wasn't because she didn't do a good job of self-advocacy, right? It, it was because there was a white cisgender lady standing in front of the judge making these arguments. And I think we have to really, as white lawyers, we have to really be ready to see that. And I, I hear from folks a lot of times like, I just don't, I just don't know that I'll be able to see it when it happens. I want to learn to recognize it. And then I don't know what to do. And I'm like, okay, well, practice. You have to actually set some time, <laughs> some time aside and practice. So like do an awkward role play with your coworker, probably your white coworker, don't want to do it with a coworker of color and figure out how you're going to respond because we see vast amounts of discrimination in our courtrooms. Um, one of the studies from Lambda, Lambda Legal um, in 2012 found that 53% of trans women of color who go into court experience or witness some form of discrimination while they are there. Um, and attorneys are the most likely group to see it and to notice it, right? We are the, the group that is most likely to, to report that we saw it and it makes sense because we're in court all the time. And so I think it's really like the onus is on white attorneys to really like you have a bar number, you have all the power in the world. You can say whatever you want in court as a white attorney, right? You have to develop some fearlessness around it and you have to develop a sense of, I don't wanna say confidence because it's actually the opposite of confidence. You have to have enough humility to be willing to say something and enough humility to know that it's actually not about you and to know what your power is. I realize that that's a little bit of a backwards way of looking at it, but to me, it's really about understanding the level of power that you have and being willing to, to see what's happening around you and be willing to use that power and be fearless about using that power. Uh, you know, one thing I would say, I, I just want to pick up on uh, uh, what Denise was saying about confidence and uh, confidence is largely overrated. I am scared shitless every time I walk into a courtroom. I give presentations to hundreds and in some case thousands of people that I've never met before. I'm scared shitless every time I do it. That doesn't mean I'm not going to do it. It just means I'm scared. So confidence has, has very little to do with it except that you will, over time, understand that your fear, the stuff in your stomach, the nervousness that you feel, is a lot of times just because you care. So one of the things I've said to myself is when I stop getting nervous about doing the things I'm doing, that's a sign that I need to start thinking about doing something else. 
I also think that uh, in terms of allyship, when people say, I don't know what to do, it's because you've never thought about it, about what you would do if you didn't have a choice. So put yourself in somebody else's shoes. You can figure out what to do. What if somebody was doing this behavior to you or someone you loved because you were white or because you were, you know, figure out whatever the difference is. When people say, I don't know what to do, I think what they're really saying is, I know what to do, but it makes me really nervous to do it because I'm going to then get into the wrong club. And, and that's another thing that I just would like to throw out there. It's like, what club are you going to be in as a lawyer? Because you can be in the club that gets you to the top of the bar association. You can be in the club that will get you to be a senior partner in a law firm. You can be in that club. You can be in the club where the judges say, oh, you're such a fine lawyer. But maybe you want to be in the club where people are saying, oh, here he comes again. He's going to make that stupid argument about redlining again. Or that's not the way you can be most effective for your client by making that argument. You should make it some other way. Maybe I want to be in the club where I am speaking the truth. So as an ally, I think speaking the truth when you see what is happening is critical. And I really don't buy so much the, I can't recognize it when I see it. Everybody recognizes it, everybody. The issue is, what are you willing to do about it? And so I'm usually asking myself, and believe me, this is like a lifelong thing. I'm struggling with it every freaking day. So I'm not speaking to you from a place of, I've got this figured out. I'm speaking to you to a place of, this is how I'm trying to deal with it. Um, you know, what is the absolute truth about this? And am I willing to say it? And sometimes I am, and sometimes you know, I've come up short. And then I ask myself, why did you cut up, come up short there? Why didn't you go just a little bit further? So I would rather be known as the lawyer of, oh shit, here he comes. What is he gonna do now? As opposed to, oh yes, he's a very good lawyer who's always reasonable and is never pushing us beyond where we wanna go. I wanna add really quickly, I, I'm aware of the time, so I'll try to be quick on what, Denise and, and Jeff are both talking about, you know, I always find it fascinating too on this idea of, of what to do. If we think about if your cousin came to you, your aunt, your mom, or whomever came to you and talked about growing up in a home with alcoholic parents or fill in the blank of any other possible issue there is, or if you aren't feeling well and you go to the doctor or you go to a therapist for any reason, the first question that they're going to ask if they're worth their weight and salt in their profession tell me about your history. Give me the background. And when we're talking about race in this country, we all know the history. We know the history. So there's, there's nothing else to really know other than we know it exists, we know it's prevalent, we know it's blatant, and we know that we have to do something about it. Now, you know, when I think of allyship, it is very important. You can't have truth and reconciliation, meaningful truth and reconciliation in this country without white people being involved. And I do recognize and see the the paralyzed state that a lot of really wonderful white people get into because it's daunting for them or I don't want to fill in the blanks of, of you know, the, the experience of, of feeling that. But, you know, what I always say as well is, you know, while you're thinking about how to be comfortable to talk to the judge or you're thinking about how to be comfortable to approach that person, you know, we're dying in the street, we're dying in cages, we're losing jobs, we're losing housing, you know, we can't be buried in particular cemeteries, you know, like while you're trying to find your comfort zone, all of these things are happening. And one of the biggest challenges in working with, with allies on this topic, this very important topic, is this idea that being a good white person, if you will, somebody who's not racist is enough. And it's not, that's actually the absolute bare minimum of the starting point, you know, right when you start to feel discomfort is the starting point of when the work should begin. And it really does require then anti-racist policies and practices that are self-imposed individually and on a systemic level, because we have to protect ourselves from ourselves, which means that we have to actually put policies in place that, 
you know, undo the damage that's been done, whether it's reparations or other things, policies and practices that, that can be put in place. It's not just, you know, beyond, and I feel you, Denise. I mean, you know, I get it. This is a conversation that we've been having for years and generations and decades, and we'll probably continue to do, continue to do so. But there really is a big gap between, you know, listen to where we're, what we're talking about, the gap between, you know, white people just recognizing if they can even see the issue or not, which is all around us, everywhere we go. I'm going to get followed in the store. I can't really say why, but I know exactly why, right? You feel me? From that to, you know, blatant racism that you see and to have a state of guilt or, or paralysis to the point to where we don't have anything getting done, which is where we are now, means that we have a really long way to go. So on one side, there's this feeling of we understand, certainly we hear the words being said of how difficult it might be. But, you know, what Jeff is getting at is, and I'm sure as hell not trying to speak on behalf of all Black people or, or Chinese people for that matter, since my mom is full, full Chinese. But I am saying personally, I know I'm tired of the incremental shit. So, you know, while we're trying to figure all this out, and again, this is not about you, Denise, at all. This is just recognizing the frustration, you know, of constant barrage of, of harm and trauma that are being pushed upon people of color in this, in this country, especially, I won't even say especially, because you can fill in the blank, whether it's Native Americans, Black people, what have you. And it really is far beyond time for white folks to um, do the actions that need to be done to help move us forward in a meaningful way. I just have one last thing I'd like to say. Uh, people saw what happened on January 6th. People saw see white people right now going crazy over critical race theory. This is an indication of the time that you folks are coming into the legal profession there has never been a time where change is more possible, in my view, in 400 years of American history. What you saw on January 6 was a group of white people who see white supremacy being challenged in a way that it has never been challenged before, and it scared the shit out of them. And that's why they reacted. When you see these people yelling and screaming at meetings about critical race theory, they don't even know what critical race theory is. But what they know is, is that if the truth actually comes out, the next question is, oh, what do we do about it? So y'all are at a point coming into this profession where anything is possible as long as you don't let yourselves be restricted by what those like us who have come before you have done. If you look at us and say, I wanna be like them, don't be surprised if you end up 50 years from now in a place that's just like it is right now. You've got to be better than what you see going on and you're capable of doing that. And this is the perfect time. It's like, you know, being a lawyer right now, if you're going to do this in a way that makes sense and that is in intentional, there is no better time in American history than right now. I fully concur with that, Jeffrey. I think now is the best time. And I envy people, young people, coming into the now because there's so much that needs to be done and so much that can be done. I think we, if we want to, we know so much more. We are um, uh, better prepared to make some changes and create a culture different than what we've experienced and what we grew up in. I, I think um, I think we need to be aware of the trappings though, and the constant effort to divide and conquer yes. so that we don't build community, we don't build uh, um, camaraderie, we don't build with one another, we build, a, we compete instead of cooperate. And we really need to be watchful of those strategies and tactics that are 
always put upon us to try to divide us so we will not be as strong, we will not be as committed, we will not be as forceful as we are when we are in, in community. Thank you all for that. Our final question, which if you all wanna just give a couple words or a few sentences on answering is, you know, having joy is a form of resistance to white supremacy. We would love to hear from you all what things you do to, to find joy. Uh, maybe it's the simplicity of my life, but I find joy um, in music, in people, in family, in um, reading and learning. And um, there's no... Um, it's joy and hope together. I find joy in young people. I find joy in being on this panel, seeing other people on this panel and, and being together. I, I, I find great joy and um, helps me keep going. <laughs> and the struggle continues. I find joy in my friends and the things that I've always loved since I was a kid. I find joy in chocolate chip cookies. I find joy in the fact that I'm about to turn 65, but don't get into a three-point shooting contest with me because I've still got that. Um, so I find, I find joy in dogs. I find joy in, you know, my wife that I love. I find joy in everything that I do. Uh, and it's important. Um, Rest is a weapon, and you've got to have that in order to do this work. Go ahead, Denise. Oh, thanks, Twyla. I was just feeling what you were saying, Jeffrey, because about rest as a weapon, and and because one of when I was thinking about these questions ahead of time, I said I to myself, like, yeah, I, I mean, I love my dog, and and I love my kid, and I love hiking um, because I love being out in nature. It really helps me keep perspective on everything that we've got going on right now and always. Um, but, you know, it gives me really great joy to be an executive director, director of an organization that pays people really well, gives people really good benefits, is a good place to work and lifts up people, you know, so that they can be their full selves. You know, one of my staff members, and I've, this is definitely, okay, this is a humble brag for real. Um, one of my staff members <laughs> said to me, you know, I've never worked in a place where my indigenous and trans identities were um, an asset. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, of course they're an asset. Like, <laughs> our work would legitimately suck without the work that you're doing. Like, <laughs> an asset. I don't know anything about what you do. Like, there's, you know, and I just, that gives me so much joy. And it gives me joy to to close our office. We closed our office at one on Friday because, um, because my, my folks were, they were doing Taking Black Pride, which is a really fantastic event that happened on Saturday. Um, we're gonna be, I knew they were gonna be doing Pride stuff all weekend. We had all been working really, really hard. And I just, I just thought to myself like, this isn't that important, right? Like time is a non-renewable resource. And I know that my queer and trans ancestors did not do what they did. They did not go through what they did so that I could work my staff to death, right? Or so that any of us could be suffering. That's not what they're, that's not what they're here for. And that's not, you know, that would, I like, how could I disrespect people like Marsha P. Johnson that way? Right? <laughs> like I have to be, I have to be building a movement that is easier than what they dealt with. Um, and that just gives me, that gives me so much joy. I love, you know, I love queer and trans communities with my whole self. I love, it is such a privilege to be gay for pay. Um, and, <laughs> and to do this work every single day, I can't, I sometimes like still can't believe that I get to do it every day, but it's, um, but I think seeing, seeing our communities and seeing what happens in our communities when the legal system get, kind of gets out of the way um, is such a beautiful thing for me. Um, that brings me so much joy when I see folks accomplish things and realize and look around and say, you know, I can't identify where the lawyers made an impact there. Like that gives me so much joy. I love seeing people use power in that way. I really appreciate 
what everyone else has said, I certainly agree as well. After spending what a year and a half of the pandemic in in bed sty and my little brownstone, it's I just enjoy being outside actually and just <laughs> living in the air and walking around and you know without a mask, quite honestly. And I guess to tie it back into work. It brings me great joy to drag a shady cop through a tight cross-examination. That's a pretty dope feeling, if I may say. My dad used to say, if you find something that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. <clears throat> Just following up on what Denise said, I think a rapper expressed it best. One, two, three, it's like ABC. If that op didn't pay, I'd rap for free. And that's what I think all of us are doing is something that we would do for free if it came to that. But it's like you say, gay for pay, I'm living the dream because I'm doing exactly what I want and making a living from it. So thank you all for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah, super fun. Well, the prejudice of the past is still codified in laws that impact us today, and that stifles equality in the present and threatens equality in the future. Um, but we heard different strategies and tools that we can all use in our practices and workplaces today to combat and dismantle white supremacy. We want to thank each of our panelists for being here and sharing their experiences with us. Thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, folks. <laughs>